One, two, three. Oh, good, we've got sound back. Oh, I've had a few TV issues this evening, you may have noticed. I'm missing, I'm one camera down at the moment, but I'm just going to leave that because I don't, I don't think I need that today, anyhow. Um, a bit frustrating, a bit annoying. Let me just let everyone on Discord know. I move, I moved the uh, workstation and um, I think because I moved the workstation I managed to unplug one of the USB devices um, and then when I replugged it back in I put it in a different port and then when I started up OBS again I had to restart the machine because it um, managed to switch its managed to hang yesterday um, and so I hadn't run it since then um, thanks Laurie great I'm glad the audio is working and um, because of that then, then when I run OBS OBS gets really confused about finding the video sources for some reason it gets itself in a right um, flap in the end I had to um, restart the machine I had to restart OBS about four times uh, and the uh, board cam you like still isn't um, playing ball it's just not listed it's really weird so we just leave that for the moment um, anyhow how is everyone Friday night woohoo as they say um, not it makes much difference to me at the moment I seem to be working weekends and weekdays although I do have you know all sorts of home family chores and stuff I have to get through every weekend but yeah it's pretty intense at the moment um, I should go through things that I've done before we get on to I need to talk about the mezzanine again because I've made a few more changes that, that, that are important but um, before I do that Uh, hmm. I forgot it. Damn it. The um, I've got the remarkable working uh, on Linux, and we need that later because I need to draw the diagrams and stuff, which I hadn't done, which I wanted to do last time. But I mean, things have changed a bit since then, anyhow. So I need to explain it. So that's a good thing. Um, it uh, it works using the Windows executable running under Wine, effectively. Um, it's been years since I've used Wine, quite frankly. But it works really well in this case, so um, I'm happy with that. And that will do, because uh, it's really useful to have that to scribble diagrams and stuff to explain stuff as we go. So that's, uh, that's on the cards for a bit. Um, what else have we had? Oh! So, yes, I mean, there's some changes with the mezzanine and the retro a little bit, but the good news is I managed to source the memory. I say I managed to source it, I've ordered it, um, and they have shipped, but they're shipping in two consignments, and I can't remember which one's which, whether this one contains the memory or not. I've ordered some, uh, um, some of the... Uh, USB devices, a um, bunch of those. I've ordered the memory for the retro, um, the retro mes. What else did I order? Something else on that. Uh, it's on the other machine, so I can't look at the order. Um, was, oh, the decoders for the memory on the retro mezzanine. We needed um, chip decoders, chip select decoders. So we ordered those as well. So that's good news. Um, 
and I ordered quite a few which will keep us going uh, as many as we're probably going to need unless something crazy happens totally unexpected and people want a lot more than uh, than we make but that seems highly unlikely to me I mean it would be a nice problem to have of course um, I mean if that did happen I'd have to do it in batches now my, my may struggle getting the any more RAM than I've already got sorry not RAM more memory generally because it's RAM and flash um, so that's the good news uh, so retro is definitely on because the components are coming um, I did do some routing and some small changes and some more planning and then I had to stop because uh, it suddenly occurred to me that there was a much better way of doing it. I, I it hit a couple of issues on the design and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to um, think carefully about this. So, so I held back from making the changes and I'm glad I did. Um, and the new, new way I'm going to do it, I think is much better. And I'm, I'm surprised at myself for not realising before that there was a better way of doing this um, and I will cover that so um, what else did I do what else is newsworthy before we get on to the uh, mezzanine um, and the board changes um, there was something else and I forget what it is now. Damn it. I had my tea, which is good. How is everyone? Let me know how you are. And let me know who's here. I know Laurie's here because he's told me the audio is fine. Thank you very much. Now, I can't remember any of the other things. I did try and get some more, um, some other components to help with the production, but I couldn't, the people I'm buying the uh, memory and stuff from don't happen to have the other bits I need. So I'm still gonna have to put another order into uh, LCSC to get everything we need. And unfortunately, one of those items is already on back order. It's the, um, what is it? It's the SD card sockets, strangely. Um, I'm hoping they will come back in stock before I put my order in. Um, but it's annoying because I can't really do the order until those are there. Um, yeah, so that's the update on the orders. Um, PCB I've still got some more work to do as I said I've made some more changes and I've got to see those through and we need to discuss those um, this evening as a matter of urgency and um, I haven't done any more on the software frankly um, I've also started work on something that could bend could potentially be the next black ice or the replacement for that because I am nearly out of those I'm getting very close to um, running out of those I've also got a problem making these these have been so popular I can't believe it virtually everyone is buying one when they're buying the black ice now I should have done these earlier really but um, I've had problems sourcing the uh, resistor arrays or one of the values on unfortunately I use three on each board and I'm down to my last five or something so that's a pain uh, I tried to source some of those but they're actually quite difficult to get they're an odd size and I don't want to I don't want to change the design because I've got hundreds of boards not hundreds I've got like you know 70 boards or whatever 
So it seems stupid change the design just for the resistor array. Um, anyhow, I'm sure I will find them. But with the remaining uh, Black Ice MX, I may actually run out of these, which will be annoying if people want them. And I may have to do some sort of back order on those or something. Um, so that's that. And as I say, I'm also looking at something that's going to replace that at some point in the future. I mean, I know I'm bringing it up now, but we're not going to see that for a while in terms of prototype. But I've finally got something, a kind of um, feature idea of how that's going to going to work. Right. So let's get let's cut to the chase. Um, we discussed the retro mezzanine uh, on Wednesday. Crikey, it was only two days ago. Yeah, um, and the plan I was looking at then um, overall is the same. I haven't changed it except the microcontroller part. When I look more closely at using the uh, microcontroller. Um, that we talked about on Wednesday. What I found was that it was going to struggle on a couple of fronts, performance wise. Um, we were pushing a bit fast. First off, the SPI is limited to a relatively pedestrian speed, which I'd forgotten about. It's like the old version of the SPI peripheral that they use in, in the um, in ESD M M0s. Maybe the M0 pluses are different or something. But um, so yeah, that, that was a bit of a problem. Uh, the USB side seems okay. Uh, I, I was still having a problem trying to get the I2C and having a problem with the port mapping because remember what we needed for the retro platform is a very wide port. Um, in, in that case, we were looking at an 8-bit port. So in other words, in retro mode, it would sit on the asynchronous, you know, address slash data bus, um, or data bus, let's say, and then provide an 8-bit access. Um, so getting that pin out, it, it's turned out to be really tricky. We were right on the edge in terms of pin use and stuff. And there's a real juggle on the peripherals I need to use and freeing up uh, a consistent number of pins on the port. Um, so that was a bit of a nightmare. Um, I decided that maybe I should look at, at changing the microcontroller again to a different one because I've got a few different ones that I could use. Um, and again, whenever you're doing this, it's a bit of a nightmare because the peripherals are literally thrown around the different ports. And in our case, what we need is an entirely free port. I mean, ideally what we would like is a full 16-bit port without any other peripherals in it. That would be ideal. So then we have a full 16-bit data width to go on the uh, asynchronous data bus for the retro design. That would be like the ultimate, right? <coughs> um, and I was struggling to even get 8 bits. And um, so I tried a few different uh, SCM candidates that I know I can get or have got in storage. And um, I remembered um, something else that I had down at the storage where um, I had this idea for a project um, that was kind of a bit Glasgow-like, actually. Um, and I kind of nicknamed it Edinburgh. And um, what it was, was it was uh, uh, an STM32H7, sorry, sorry, STM32F7 uh, in a BGA package 
um, with a lot of pins on it and it has uh, 176 plus 25 pins so there's a lot um, but it has a higher uh, ball grid pitch and I thought mm, I know how much trouble I've had with the small uh, ball pitches but then I looked at it again and I realized it's actually the pitch is actually quite um, quite generous I don't know if generous is the right word it's a 0.65 pitch which is good so when you get down to like 0.6 and then 0.5 it, it becomes really tricky and you have to change your PCB process and you have to go for much more expensive uh, PCB processes because in order to escape you know root out the uh, tracks in between the balls which you need to do you know once for every two sets of balls in uh, on a multi-layer board <clears throat> but at, at uh, 0.65 pitch it's actually pretty easy to do on a standard JLPCB process if I say the standard I mean the four layer process so I thought bingo maybe this is a trick and so the today I had a really um, intense day of trying to reimagine this using uh, this STM 32BGA chip the F7 chip it's the same family as the, the old F7 chip that we were going to use originally but it's a larger ball grid array obviously um, but its functionality is pretty similar to the old one but it has a bunch of advantages one it has a whole crap ton of pins not pins but balls that's good that increases the chance of us finding a consecutive set of pins or balls that um, you know give us nice asynchronous access so we can map it into the memory memory bus of the retro so um, I've had a play around um, with putting all the existing peripherals in and being able to try and keep some port at least one port free so I know I can do up to 12 bits on one port without breaking things peripheral wise I can definitely do 12 bit port okay I think I can also do a 16 bit port but the one thing I have to sacrifice if I go for a full 16 bit port even on something with the, the number of pins that this has got um, it means I have to remove the low frequency crystal um, which is used by the real-time clock. Now you can still use the real-time clock because there's an internal uh, low power, low frequency oscillator that can be used for that. It's just the accuracy isn't as good as a crystal. Now if you're making a watch or something that would be a bad thing. But in our situation it's probably less critical. So it's probably a worthy sacrifice. Probably. Uh, again, I want to get some feedback from you guys. I know we haven't used the RTCs much anyhow. Um, but anyhow, let me know your thoughts on that. But what this would mean is that we'd have an F7, STM32. <coughs> that will provide a 16-bit data port, which we can attach to the asynchronous bus of the retro scenario. That means we can memory map the STM32 into the memory map of the FPGA and it will operate at 16-bit data which is good. Also the F7 is a crap ton faster than the M0 so it will respond you know pretty quickly. I don't know how fast it is because I haven't done any GPIO responses um, but we could certainly do an interrupt driven arrangement on the you know write enable or output enables to make it 
fairly low latency and fairly quick possibly faster than the existing memory and flash that we're adding in on the Vetra. So that will mean we can go ahead with the plan as was, but with a better STM32, a better controller. Now, there is some really good other wins with this. It does, the cost is more um, obviously an F7 is much more expensive than an M0 and in this case because it's a big you know 160 76 ball FPGA or ball grid array not FPGA ball grid array then um, yeah it is more expensive component than the M0 however we were originally going with an F7 anyhow so no big loss there really but there are significant improvements that it provides as well as doing what we want on the retro side it has some advantages so if I compare it to the M0 for example um, it has a 4-bit SD rather than just an SPI for the SD card so it's actually faster at reading the SD card so that's one obvious advantage what sort of costs are those chips? Well, I'm probably not going to answer that very easily at this point because you can't actually buy them. The only reason I'm considering it here is I have enough of them just for the proposed number that I, I want to build over the next few months. So they're already paid for. Um, the, and I, you know, got them prior to the real price hike, so I got them, got them at reasonable cost. Let's put it that way. I mean, they weren't cheap. Now, so it's got this SD MMC and 4-bit SD driver in as well, which is better than just using the SPI, which is what we had um, on the on the M0 solution with the rest of it. Now, better still is I've got Quad SPI for the flash. Um, the local flash to the STM32 so that's faster I can actually use Quad SPI to uh, read and write to the flash that's good but there are still more bonuses because this has got some really nice features one of the features is it has an extensive uh, memory peripheral on it and I can actually attach SD RAM to this. So we could add an SD RAM chip to the microcontroller and that gives us a whole bunch more memory. Why might we want that? Well, it's always useful to have a lot more memory, particularly if you want to work on things like image processing, if you're attaching a camera, for example. Uh, or if you're doing something in audio that requires lots of buffering and things. Um, it's a really nice win and the SD uh, RAM, um, I've had a look and I think I can source it. Now it has to be a particular type of SD RAM, it's quite confined, it's not like an FPGA where you're programming the state machine and stuff, it has to be something that's supported um, by the uh, uh, FMC peripheral in the STM32. Um, but I think I can get those. Um, so that is an option for it, which I think is really good. The other thing that we could do, if we've got that extra memory, and we've got a quad SPI flash on the STM32, is in the situation where we're maybe not doing retro or even if we are doing retro we will have enough flash and um, memory to be able to run I think MicroPython uh, there are F7 versions of MicroPython already but we'd need to port those uh, and I need to look and see what was involved in doing that so we we then have a choice so 
So we can either put rust on it and have rust firmware, or if somebody really wanted to have um, a Python interface, then we could we could offer that as well. And I think that's really attractive to a whole bunch of people. I mean, it may even be possible to put Circuit Python on there, but porting that is significantly more difficult, in my opinion. But it's doable. You know, it, it just takes you know a few people who know what they're doing to get that working. Um, not just me. Um, I could do some of it, but not all of it. I'd need to pull in some help from somewhere. But it's nice to think that we can add that in if we want to as an option. So not only do we have the Rust stuff, but we also potentially have MicroPython capable directly on the STM32. And that's a really big win, uh, subject to getting it ported and working. And if that's not good enough, there is one more advantage that I think we can take. Um, I've still got a little bit of doubt in my mind because it's slightly different. In this particular device, one of the reasons that I bought this device originally was it had a built-in, um, as well as the regular uh, Synopsys USB, it has a built-in high-speed, uh, USB 2 high-speed, uh, UMTI, uh, PHY, is it UMTI? Uh, which means it will operate up to a 480 megabits per second. So we get a much higher bandwidth USB wise up to the host. That means we can do a whole bunch of things. Okay. Now that's the kind of thing that Glasgow has as well, by the way, it has a USB full speed 480 megabits per second, um, as does Luna. Uh, but in our case, running that USB stuff on the FPGA is quite difficult at that speed. But in this case, the STM32 um, has a built in peripheral and can run at that speed. So there's another big win there. Um, and this is kind of why I'm kicking myself a bit because I'd forgotten about this. Um, I'd put it right off to the side because I was, I was thinking that the, uh, the pitch on it was going to be a problem on the four layer process for regular PCBs and I didn't want to move into a more expensive one. But uh, I think we're going to be okay with that. I think we're going to be able to do it. So that's new. So what do you think folks? There's a whole bunch of advantages there and I'm not you know, saying there isn't going to be some work because I do have to make a few more changes in order to accommodate it. But it's not a huge number of changes from what I was already doing with the rest of it. But somehow I do have to, you know, um, I wouldn't say crowbar it in to the board because, you know, we had the 100. Uh, FQN which is huge and this chip is smaller than that considerably smaller this is similar size to the BGA F, BGA FPGA ice 40 that we've got on the board um, so I can get that in but if we want to add the ST RAM, SD RAM that's a 54 pin TSOP um, and I think the only way we can do that is put that on the underside of the board I mean, that's not a big issue because we're already using the other side of the board anyhow. You have to with these BGAs because you have to put your decoupling and stuff on the other side. Um, but I may need to fess around with things like the SD card. I might need to change which SD card we're using. Because uh, the one we've got on there is a bit bulky. Maybe I'll go for something smaller. That buys me a bit more room on the underside. Uh, it also gets around the problem of the fact that I can't actually buy them uh, from the supplier at the moment because they're out of stock. So there is a bit more work involved, but not a huge amount because um, most of that I would have had to do with the um, with the retro changes anyhow. So, you know, I stopped that yesterday after getting this idea, slept on it and then 
looked at it all today to see if it was feasible and the answer is it sounds very feasible um, so it's been a really good day from that perspective because I can't see any showstoppers right now for doing it um, what I haven't thought about yet so that that solves the um, that solves the retro issue that I talked about that means that we have a solution to that but it we also we're also opening some new doors here in terms of forget the micro Python stuff for a moment we could do that later we don't have to do that straight away uh, we can use a lot of the existing Rust stuff so that's not a problem so we can use the existing firmware now one of the things that we will have to um, take advantage of though is this high-speed link to the host so that could be really useful just in the same way that Glasgow uses a high-speed USB 2 or 480 megabit per second link in the form of a I think it's an 8081 controller or something um, we have a similar arrangement here with the STM32 F7 because it has a high-speed link in that means we can move data backwards and forwards from the host and the FPGA really quickly if we need to. Particularly given that we've now mapped the STM32 into the address space of the FPGA. So for example, you can imagine a scenario where maybe we want to do some real-time logic analysis, okay? So we can put a design peripheral in the um, uh, in the ICE forty that literally samples different things like a logic analyzer would, but internal to the FPGA, and then writes it into the address space onto the data bus, and have the STM shove that straight up uh, the USB. Um, just like a logic analyzer effectively because we've got lots of bandwidth to be able to do that um, and I foresee that being useful you know maybe with a bit of Python on the host being able to take advantage of that the other thing that we could possibly do is take a look at the way that they're using Amaranth and stuff on Glasgow and we could probably do some of that as well that will probably work in this this scenario so there's a bunch of features there that we could um, really get some value out of. Um, and we need to start thinking about how we would do that. The knock on, by the way, from a hardware point of view is that I will no longer move the micro onto the mezzanine. I will have it uh, on the IceLogic bench itself because I don't need to change it I don't need a different one for the different scenarios now because in both scenarios or all scenarios if you like we're using the same microcontroller so it can go um, onto the IceLogic bench along with the USB connectors and the power delivery etc so we're kind of going back a bit but moving forward now with the new retro features um, the retro RAM will be an option that fits you know as before as we discussed last time I it fits over the mezzanine and the other tile um, in the non retro case then we've got a bunch of options um, you know as we did before really those those don't change although we may want to vary that now given we've got a whole bunch of features that may be change the priorities of what we might put on a mezzanine um, and what we keep on say the tiles so that's where we are so it's exciting stuff um, I'm hoping that will also give you folks some more ideas to come back at me with um, and we need to 
think about how how we prioritize those different things I'm now a little bit um, undecided on the alternative mezzanines to the retro because this has probably changed the balance you know the fact here, here's one issue for example right if we've got you know um, I don't know eight megs of SD RAM attached to the microcontroller on the ice logic bench for example do we still you know as a non retro um, mezzanine do we still think it would be a good idea adding the flash memory onto the FPGA that's a question that we need to think about because there's a lot more memory in the equation already now on the ice logic board that means that we might not need the memory in the same way that we did before we might want to prioritize what goes on that mezzanine instead of memory for the FPGA because in the total heterogeneous solution we've already got a whole bunch of memory you know attached to the uh, to the microcontroller part of that equation so the extra memory in the FPGA might not be so important we might see the FPGA merely in that case as dealing with the peripherals as a kind of peripheral bus if you like that connects to all the tiles So, yeah, so for the other, you know, mezzanine, it's up in the air. We need to just rethink, given the new features that we've already got, that are being built into the ice logic bench, because we may want to prioritize what we put on uh, the mezzanine and or uh, center tile. So definitely worth thinking about so that's that one um, I mean it's, there's no hurry for that because I want to do the retro stuff first anyhow that's the highest priority for me is the I know we call it retro but it's really the FPGA centric modus operandi okay um, and again you know the power that we're adding in with this particular choice of uh, microcontrollers means that you know that being mapped in to a 60 as a 16 bit data bus peripheral gives us all sorts of things that we probably couldn't couldn't easily have done before um, hmm interesting I mean another way of looking at it might be well what memory do we now need for the FPGA in the non retro situation maybe we just need enough memory uh, to act as a frame buffer Or in the non retro situation but then again we might not be using a frame bus if we if we're using it in an industrial situation for example or robotic situation then that's really of no consequence um, so yeah we need to think about the use cases the non retro use cases a bit more to come up with uh, wants needs versus features and provision so yeah but anyway let me know your thoughts um, on the industrial view for example 
let me give you I'll give you an example so what would be nice on an industrial view is a mezzanine with something undecided on that and a tile that does as I mentioned before Ethernet can and maybe RS485 um, we can separate those two out so that that there's a tile for doing that that fits in the center portion if we do an extra cutout to allow for the uh, the socket size and then the mezzanine could have something separate on it what, what would we put on that mezzanine um, we've got quite a bit of memory on the microcontroller we could put a camera on that mezzanine for example um, We could put an LCD, parallel LCD on it. There's plenty of pins in an unretro situation that can be used. Um, we could possibly even change the way that the STM32 talks to the FPGA. Currently, we've been imagining in an unretro situation that that's going to be QSPY. Uh, maybe we can go further. Uh, whatever it is, it needs to balance and work with the pin arrangements for the retro, which may give us some constraints that we have to follow. But we do have some, uh, some flexibility in that regard. What type of camera? Um, well, camera-wise, we'd probably use like an OV75 seven six. Is it? What What was the one that you uh, did support for, Laurie? In in H in um, Amazon, was it OV? Or should I say Amazon? It was Amazon. Yeah, seven six seventy. Sorry, I always get these numbers mixed up. Probably something like that, Western. Um, half the trick with these cameras isn't so much the uh, the data, it's configuring the damn things. So once you get one working, um, it's quite a good idea to stick with it. These aren't really high res, by the way, Western. And we tend to operate them at low res anyhow. And they're parallel, so it's not like MIPI uh serial it's like uh, mippy parallel but that takes about 11 or 12 pins which we can put either on a tile or we can put as i say on a mezzanine and the uh um the ice 40 is capable of you know speaking to that uh having the uh fpga in the equation means you can do things like down sampling and resizing and all that kind of stuff so when the data gets to the microcontroller bit that may be doing some processing on it, a lot of the pre-processed color corrections and all that stuff can happen in the FPGA. So it, it takes a, a lot of the load off um, when it comes to the signal processing and stuff. Western Long says, uh, that one is a rolling shutter. Yeah, are you thinking uh, global shutter rather than roller um, usually on robots for localization or obstacle detection we use stereo systems and global shutters um, I think we'd be pushing it for a stereo system um, on this platform I think you know next year or whatever when we do an ECP5 board then stereo vi vision systems become feasible very difficult to imagine that happening with the processing power that we've got on this and the number of uh, you know resources in the FPGA but um, we could use global shutters definitely uh, it's finding a decently supported camera I know that OpenMV um, sourced global shutter cameras uh, so if we could find out what they sourced 
we could because it's open source we can crib all their register settings and things um, and then potentially use that uh, the global shutter cameras are a lot more expensive though um, yeah if anyone's got any pointers on reasonable cost uh, global shutter cameras let me know some are affordable but I agree that it's too expensive for this solution um, you, you can Laurie says the global shutter cameras I've seen cost thousands of dollars you can get them cheaper than that have a, have a little poke around guys and if you see anything uh, oh, oh let's just have a quick look just see if it's obvious um, bear with me a sec Let me see if I can find So, let's have a look. Cams. The global camera shutter. See, look, this is only fifty dollars. So it's actually quite reasonable. Um, oh, this is. I tell you what, this is. Uh, isn't that the on semi? They, these are well documented as well, unlike a lot of the Chinese or Asian ones. Hold on. Can you find this? Yeah, so this this is um, quite well documented, which is good. That makes it a lot easier um, when you come to do the um, HDL and the software and the register configurations and stuff. It's the on the on semi ones are much better documented than you know the Asian equivalents. They're very well documented. I've looked at these before, but yeah. I don't know how many we'd need to buy in order to um, get a decent price on them but we could do something like a group buy if we wanted to it'd be useful to have anyhow I mean we could obviously use them on um, on the uh, the industrial deck but also future versions of the industrial deck when we move up to um, East P5 you know next year or whatever um, you'll be able to u reuse all the tiles that you've got and that kind of stuff um, and any cameras and things so any investment you make is good for the long term so let me just check here actually let me see if, let's zoom in a bit more on here I wonder if I can actually just squeeze that in see what I do You probably just don't want to be looking at my ugly mug all the time, anyhow. Right. Uh, let's see what they say here. Um, RA format uh, 752 by 480, which is fine for our purposes. Uh, global shutter. Well, they do an NIR illumination 
thing which is useful if you're doing things like number plates and stuff or low light situations. Um, readouts, which we can reduce the set. What's the interface? I'm presuming it's just, yeah. Um, oh, wait a minute. Wait, this is weird. LVDS. Oh, it's it will do 10 bit parallel, standalone, 8 bit or 10 bit serial LVDS. What do they mean by that? Let's have a look at the pinout. Um, serial data and how what is this something that's supported by the ice 40 serial? Um, I mean, we could always use parallel. Even if we can't use the serial, frankly, probably easiest just to use the parallel. But uh, the uh, Serdes mode, it depends how the Serdes mode is set up, whether it's a very high speed one or not. That might be quite high speed because it's only a single channel uh, bypass clock. Serial control address zero and one. Hmm. I mean, it's doable either way, I think. Now, uh, there's another serial channel here. What does it say? Yeah, we could just use the parallel. Probably don't need to bother with the serial stuff. Um, the only advantage of using the serial stuff is that it saves the number of pins, right? If it's a, an LVDS mode that's supported by the ICE 40 and those pins are available, which is, um, that would mean it would be possibly mezzanine only rather than a tile. Um, whereas if you do the parallel data, that can work on any tile theoretically. To do 10 bit, you'd need so I'm at 10, 11, 12. You'd actually need 13 IOs. So that would be above the 12 for a tile. But if you did it on the mezzanine, you'd have enough pins. So that's doable if you want the 10 bit. I think that basically enables you to use a slightly higher color mode than the uh, 8 bit I guess um, probably says more about the modes here but these if you look at these data sheets I'll just post the um, URL of those because um, they are so much better if you've ever worked with the Asian ones they're not the easiest read in the world these tend to be much better in my opinion I think uh, OpenMV do quite a bit of work with on semi cameras so I think they are like a favoured supplier. <coughs> you know, you even get diagrams, look. Can you believe it? Diagrams. Really nice. So yeah, I mean, it, it's feasible, Western, on the global uh, shutter front. Then you'd have to worry about your tearing and all the other things, you know. And if you want to capture faster movement, you can do that. Depends how you're using it to, as to how important that is. But 
but yeah definitely uh, a candidate what did I say about the serial bus just, uh, two, two was oh they're talking about the address it's just I2C <laughs> Excuse me for yawning. Oh, tea's finished. Move on to the um, cold liquid refreshments now. But yeah, this looks like a good candidate. It's not too high res because we can't handle the really high res anyhow, particularly on a, uh, an FPGA like this. There's a limit to how much processing it can do and how much memory it's got. Um, what you probably want to do is have all the real inline stuff going on on the FPGA. So you're doing the line by line, or you're, you're, you're capturing a certain number of lines and processing them in real time, rather than capturing an entire frame. Um, then the memory requirements drop right down, so you can use you know your faster um, in memory in the FPGA. I mean, Laurie says, I think you want enough memory for the frame buffer, even for robotics. Um, yes and no. I mean, obviously it's preferable. Some algorithms need the whole frame, yeah. But what I'm saying is you get the FPGA to do the parts that aren't like that so it can do here's the kind of things it can do without having a whole frame it can do things like uh bayer deep bayer it can do gamma correction color correction white balance it can do resizing interpolations it can do noise reductions it can do all of those sorts of things in real time just by taking um you know bunches of lines at once um, and it takes the load, you know, so what comes out of that is a smaller image that's been resized but optimised, or you can have it do things like blob tracking, you know, in a limited window size, and then you can, you know, have area of interest, so you're just tracking an area of interest within the larger image, but what you pass back to the uh, STM32 is just the area of interest in a rectangle and not the other things, plus the vectors of its position. Um, so there's lots of tricks that you can pull um, that will leverage the FPGA without it having to have a full frame, for example. And then you have the real finky stuff, the real clever stuff happening in the microcontroller. And if it's got the SD RAM as well, you know, we could probably have eight eight megabytes of uh, SD RAM you've got a floating point um, built into the F7 as well so you can do you know the more clever stuff on the uh, STM32 rather than trying to do that on the um, FPGA itself and by the way guess who's got really good optimized algorithms for all of that that run on F7s and H7s are good friends at Open uh, Open MV, so we can go and um, you know have a poke around in their uh, image processing code. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff we can get, you know, by borrowing some of their libraries and things. I'm sure uh, that's exactly what Arduino do. They took all of their stuff from Open MV. Um, although most of that is written in C by the way not Rust I think if you're going to do the image processing it's probably you're going to get to a solution quicker with C than you will with Rust because I don't think there's that much in Rust right now in terms of optimised libraries for the image processing particularly on the embedded systems 
Um, but the other thing that, um, again, OpenMV do is they support MicroPython running on the F7 and the H7. So we could do something similar to what they're doing, really. The code's there. We can go and have a look at it and see what they've done and, you know, take hints from them. Um, it's not difficult to do that. Uh, our advantage is that we have this extra FPGA pre-processing, if you like, where we can offload a whole crap load of stuff that they would have to normally do inside their um, F7 or H7. And Laurie says, and uh, frame is very good, useful for diagnostic uh, diagnostics. It is, but you can do those diagnostics on the microcontroller as well, don't forget. The other thing is, we've got a high speed link back up to the host on this microcontroller, Laurie now. So we could shove that video up, you know, pronto to the host. Uh, and do even more um, analysis and stuff. It's definitely achievable. But yeah, you've got to think carefully about how you're going to divide and conquer those sorts of problems. What's going to work on the FPGA? Remember, if you're not running a soft core in the FPGA, you've got all of the FPGA resources to throw at this, or more of them. I know we're only talking about, you know, 8,000 LUTs here, but you can do quite a bit with that. You know, the biggest limitation is really the memory in that you've only got 16K of, uh, you know, embedded memory. Um, but we can hook more memory onto the FPGA if we need to. It's just, by the time you've done that, you may as well have shoved it up to the uh, microcontroller and have it do that. Uh, Lloyd Griffiths, it's easier to connect VGA or HDMI, HDMI to the FPGA to view the image in real time. Oh, that reminds me. Yes. One of the other things that I was thinking about, now we're going right off track here, we're going following all sorts of squirrels, is on the frame buffer thing. At the moment we're assuming, certainly for the retro, you know, situation, we've literally just got a VGA type connector and a DAC and, you know, a flash DAC. Or we've got HDMI, maybe with digital audio as well, but that's it. There is another option that we could do. Uh, we could design our own GPU um, that also goes on that tile. So you could have a kind of pro HDMI tile that can do some extra bits and bobs. So for example, what about this for an example? We take a nice, uh, an up 5K, and we put that on the HDMI tile, yeah? And then we connect to that, we have four lanes of high-speed SERDES, uh, not SERDES, high-speed LVDS type differential between the, you know, the, the ICE 40 on the, ice bench to the tile and the tile then has the up 5k which also has four lanes of differential kind of surdies low speed surdies um, plus there's an extra four lines for control and programming the up 5k then we connect the uh, HDMI signals to the up 5k and it's capable of driving those. I'm not sure up to what frequency it will drive those, but it's certainly capable of doing the lower resolutions. And the advantage of that is you've then got 5K worth, another 5K's worth of logic gates 
right next to the HDMI port that you can use to build your own GPU. Plus, you've got a built-in frame buffer. So if you were just to support like a low resolution HDMI mode, like 640 by 480, for example, um, you've got a megabit of uh, 70 megahertz SRAM, not SRAM, what is it? What do they call it in the up 5K? I've forgotten what it's called. Is it PSRAM or SRAM? But it's like, I think, it's quite fast anyhow. Um, and you can use that as your frame buffer. SP RAM, thank you. All right. And you could use that as a frame buffer. That has enough for 64480 24-bit, I think. This was another thing I had, idea I had out walking yesterday lunchtime. So we could then build our own GPU around an up 5K. How cool would that be? So it offloads all the graphics and the frame buffer, etc. So in that scenario where you want to send your video to the um, to the HDMI, you don't need the frame buffer because the frame buffer would be next to the HDMI connector in the up 5K. You just serialize the data out as it comes in and you've processed it. Um, or you could have the UP 5K do some processing as well. Don't forget that the UP 5K has, let me just check, uh, has a few DSPs in it, not many, but they could be handy. Uh, I forget the... Um, Oh, what's going on here? That was very slow. Uh, you have uh, where does it say? You have the here. You have uh, eight. Eight DSP units, which could be helpful. And you got a few uh, EVR RAM, although not a lot, in addition. So, what about that as an idea? I thought it was a cracker yesterday. So, you can build your own uh, GPU tile. I just thought that'd be really cool. And there are lots of people into doing the GPU stuff at the moment. So once you go beyond doing your own core, then you start thinking about doing the GPU. I know, um, I think iPost wanted to do some work on that as well. I don't know if you're around iPost. I don't think he's logged in at the moment. Can't see him on uh, Discord either. A 640 or 752 times 480, 16 bit frame buffer is bigger than the up SP RAM. How, how much is that? Wait a minute, 640 by 480. Right, six, 640, it may be uh, times 480. So that's, if you wanted 8 bit, that would be 307k. So, 16 bit would be 640, 14k. Am I right? Am I right? K bytes, I'm talking about here. And what have we got? We've, we've put, how much have we got? Hold on. You've got 1024 K bits, which is 128. Yeah, yeah, we've probably not got enough of them. Hold on, 1024 
So we've got 128k. So that's going to limit us to. Yeah, that's not going to be enough. The only other possibility then. I'm just thinking pins. So we've got two pairs for the HDMI, two pairs for streaming in. So that's 816. A few control pins, number four, that's 20. We've still got another 19 pins. We could add hyperflash. To the um, to the up five k, that'd be one way of doing it. I'm just trying to think what the cheapest way of doing that is. I mean, 128k doesn't really buy as much as it. I was thinking there's more than that for some reason. Um, so, right, 320 times 2, times 240, of course. You could do a kind of. No, you can't even do 320 by 240, can you? Um, not 16 bit. Uh, you need 150 for that. I mean, if you doubled up the pixels, yeah, what would you have? You'd have somewhere in between the two. Uh, the OpenMV ID streams camera data to the frame buffer on the host. The fast USB would help with that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if we could use their software, host software. I don't think they operate a standard between their uh, host software and the um, and the OpenMV embedded devices. Although it is open, I mean you can go and have a look at it. I don't think it's I'm not sure it's standard. I don't know what they use. Is it like a multiple USB devices or is it a single USB port as a serial device that they stuff everything up and down? I can't remember. Um, yeah, there's all sorts that could be done. I think. And the fast USB definitely helps. I don't think they have fast USB on theirs. Certainly on the original ones they didn't. I don't know about the newer ones. This room will be fast enough, that's probably not quick enough for a frame buffer. It would have to be high around. Anyhow, just an idea on the GPU front. Um, okay, anything else we need to look at on this front? Do I need to keep this page open? I don't think I do. Do they do this? Yeah. I think you can buy it with a lens as well, look. But I expect those lenses are fairly standard. Friday tiredness. Been a week.
Oh, the IR filter is removable. Or maybe that's their filter that they're using. Coolio. Yeah, these data sheets are so much better to read than the kind of was it Omnivision? Make all the uh, Asian ones. Their data sheets aren't what I'd consider very uh, engineering friendly. But these do look good. They do lower cost cameras as well, not just uh, global. But they do uh, rolling shutter ones as well. But they are more expensive than the uh, Asian counterparts. See, it's much better documented from this point of view. Refreshing in comparison, what's this? Seem to be going down that camera rabbit hole, but it is quite a good cool one. I mean, fifty dollars for a global shutter is really good. We could even support their camera modules, possibly. This format. Um, if I remember, does it show you the back? just got like a little um, surface mount type socket on the back we could support that wouldn't be difficult then you could use their models directly it's another possibility Oh, he says the uh, 640 480 VGA needs to read a pixel uh, every cycle of a 25 megahertz clock, so 40 nanoseconds. Yeah, well, if you were operating hyper RAM on your GPU, you'd probably run it about 100 megahertz. So you could hit that. Because you've got to read and write to it. Mind you, you've got the address overhead. But I mean, you'd be doing it in bursts and then caching it locally before sending it out. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's possible. It would certainly be an interesting exercise if nothing else. Um, but it'd be kind of cool. But lots of food for thought. Any other questions um, on this stuff or ideas? Even a few squirrels, I don't mind. It's Friday. Right, well, I'll be back in a second. I'm just going to go and get a um, refill. Keep me hydrated. I you guys have a think.
Eyes are back. So let me um, quickly draw up where we are. Um, let's turn the page. Let's just revise where we are in terms of the uh, configuration. So I want to make sure that you guys understand and you girls. Oh, right. Um, Just turn the browser off. Hold on. What? Oh, it's got three browsers. Um. So, um, got the FPGA here, let's start in the center, it's probably the easiest. Um, so if I draw the retro, um, We've got a basically there is memory. Oh, that's a really crap one. I wish this would fix, finish the squares for you, like the iPad does. Maybe one day. So there's a 16 bit bus. something like this right? that's the data bus and then in addition you've got uh, an address bus remember exactly um I 
see how big this is. Uh, I think it's like I think it's 12 bits, but I'll, I'll have to double check. What am I saying? Talking rubbish. I think it's 22. Thereabouts. There is also a um, a decoder. I think that's got. Possibly, but the decode lines I think this is uh, two bits. And it's also shared with this. So this can read it. There's a good reason for that. And then there's also a control on here. And there's another two lines. So there's two there and two there. Together, those two can be used to program the uh, SPI on the ICE 40. But their second use is TX, sorry, UART. Uh, I think this was the way we were planning UART. And. Um, Uh, selects. But the STM can disable the select because when it's writing to program the FPGA it needs to make sure it doesn't end up writing inadvertently to memory because some of those uh, are used for the chip selection uh, after they're decoded. So it disables the decoder um, this is, I think it's a uh, HC139 or half of. That's terrible writing. I'm to read my scribbles. Is there any trouble with a pad? I have to put up with my um, crappy. I think it's a free nine. It's half of it. I only use half. The um, so these four lines here that make up the TX and the select lines on the bottom. Um, those are connected to the SPI pins on the ICE forty. So you know, this is like spy. Yeah, so we can use that to program the ICE 40 as well, but we disable the chip selects decoding before we do that, so that we don't inadvertently write anything to uh, the PS RAM and flash. Okay, so this is where it gets interesting because um, one of the things I was thinking is oh, um, what I haven't shown here is there's an SD card SD 
and there's also obviously USB in our case and hmm, I've not left myself enough room what a surprise uh, It's just slightly. You need to get everything on, so let's put USB here. Better job than this, Mr. Wood. USB. Uh, let's put the SD card down here. missing <laughs> am I missing anything there's actually two USBs potentially and there's also can I've not included that one here um, Can USB. I use the same pins for those actually, I think. Or separate ones. Um, there's a whole bunch of other peripherals that we're probably not using on the STM32, but you know, GPIOs. I'm not sure if we'd do anything with those. And there's probably going to be an LED. RGB LED. Um, so, now if I've forgotten anything, just jog me. There's also a debug as well. The, um, so here, if we, if you're running a soft core on the ICE 40, well, tell you what else we're missing. We've got, you know, terrible drawing diagrams. I really wish this had a straightener. Here we go. This is drawn from a retro point of view. It's slightly different when you look at it from a non-retro. So you've got four tiles. One, two, three. You've also got ADCs. 
interrupts from STM. I'm not going to draw those in. So, yeah, to complete the diagram, let's look at this from a data point of view. One of the things I was thinking is you, if you wanted to load the flash, if you already programmed the ICE 40 with a retro image, then it could accept, you know, stuff coming up through the USB, uh, transferred over the UART, and it could then put it directly into flash itself. I'll tell you what I forgot to put on, it's really important is there is Sierra quad SPI flash. Just put a Q in there. So you can either program the internal flash with the DFU program, or you could run something serially that linked directly to an image running or synthesis running on the ICE 40 that could then take from the serial port and put it into flash. Or we could read from the flash that we'd already written stuff to here um, and, and well the question is how we get that to data I mean we can shove it over the UART but in most cases here the ICE 40 is in control but we could write an image into the ICE 40 that did something clever so what I could write into the ICE 40 here is a synthesis that's a bit like uh, a PSRAM MUX. So what would happen then is using this data bus, I'd write the address bytes to the ICE 40 of where I want to write to successively. Um, so I'd set the base address and then I would incrementally clock the data directly into the flash or PSRAM and increment the address on the ICE 40 through the address bus. That way the STM32 could have a special image it writes to here to enable it to write directly to the flash or the PSRAM on the um, on the uh, asynchronous bus. Yeah, I've not included C done, you're right. Uh, I should probably have a nod to those. Plus C done. And reset. Um, didn't you also say there was an external flash on the STM? Yeah, I've drawn that in here, that's where my Q is. So what do you think of this possibility then? So I, I put a specified image into the ICE 40 here where it acts as our address muxer. So I can send data to it over the data bus. So I've reversed the role here. It can then use, it can then put that address on here to the flash or the PSRAM. And I can then write data into the um, flash or PSRAM and program it directly rather than have to do everything over the UART. Uh, there is no way you could do it. You could, if, if you're in retro mode, of course, the IS-40 could read data from the STM32. Um, you know, that in turn could read it from its internal flash and it could read it from here but then it has to switch to writing to there. So it'd have to take it in the ICE 40, store it in the local memory, and then write it out, which just seems maybe a bit too e and pro -y to me. But if you've got a decent sized buffer here, you know, part of that 16K um, internal memory, you could use that to buffer some nice big chunks of that, like that. So you've actually got two ways of operating here. In the normal retro mode, you know, the ICE 40 is the master. It's in control of the asynchronous address data bus. Um, and it literally commands, it, it will talk to the STM and ask it and read and write. You know, you could have mapped into this memory map here. Could be, you know, 
the SPI flash or well you don't have the address bus um, you have some um, select lines and the STM32 also has partial access it's not drawn into here into some of the address lines but only a handful uh, I can't remember how many exactly but not very many so that gives us several address ports inside the STM32 so it's no good treating the STM32 as memory because there isn't enough address lines to make that useful um, but you could view these as ports so you know one of the ports might be reading the ADC uh, that may be one address uh, you'd actually need multiple addresses because you've got multiple well no you wouldn't uh, if you if you're doing a 16-bit read then you'll get a 12-bit result from the ADC the extra four bits can tell you which channel of the ADC that is um, for example so you could successively read all of the channels if you wanted to um, you'd also have a port in there for reading the flash maybe uh, then a port in there for reading the SD card plus you'd have a port in there to send data to the USB and that's really just like a FIFO inside the STM32 that you're going to successively send you know data to it's more like a stream than um, than an addressed arrangement um, and I think that covers the basic use cases um, does that sound um, sound about right Laurie Preston whoever's listening hydration break as you think about what I just said I hope everyone understands my um, scribblings uh, you didn't answer my question about ice 40 programming SPI okay let me just scroll back so the SPI to program the ice 40 is just um, SC, SC, LK, Mozzie, and Chip Select. You don't need me so now. I can hear a little scratching. <laughs> little animal wishes to come and say hello, I no doubt. Hello, Twin Cross. Have you come in to say hello to everyone? Oh, he's making a beeline for the food. I better give her a few more biscuits actually. All bit hungry, I'm hungry. You haven't finished what I gave you, well. You can have some biscuits. has that had and what are they used for have I answered your SPI programming question first off Laurie oh yeah the SPI lines are reused for the chip selects and the UART so when we're not programming uh, the ice 40 uh, they become a UART port and they also become the CS CS pins 
the encoded chip select. Uh, with two pins, you've got four different chip selects because you need to be able to select between flash, PS RAM, STM32, etc. It's a little bit more complicated than that, and I'm not showing all the detail of that because the diagram gets really complicated. But yeah, that's effectively what's happening. Are you going to say hello, Twinks? Oh, say hello. Hmm? Or be finishing your biscuits. through the door again I get it you only come in here for food or passage through to outside Um, so, I mean, are they reused as you are? Did I answer that one? I think I did. Can Rust firmware handle that reuse? There's some gotchas. There's, there's, there's a different way of doing it. So, for example, what I can do is I can connect the UART pins to... Um, To the SPI pins for example there's another got you in there because I need to disable the, some of the SPI pins or I can just bit bang the SPI is the other solution then I don't get the conflict there are different ways of solving the problem I mean, one of the things I looked at, I mean, I can choose the SPI pins such that they have a UART on them, uh, is the other thing. But that means you have to unload the SPI uh, configuration and then turn them back into unused peripherals and then take them back out and convert them into a UART. But I'm, until I get a bit closer to that, there's. I'm not sure how easy or difficult it is to deal with that problem. But on a simple level, I just bit bang it if push comes to shove. Or connect different pins together using uh, like a resistor network another way of doing it so one peripheral takes over from the other but from a software point of view they are separate because they're actually separate balls they're just connected together via resistors in a clever way to um, allow one to override the other but yeah I mean it, it is an issue and I have thought about that um, and there are of different potential solutions I'm not sure which way is the best way to go yet but it's a relatively um, small problem just with those four pins because of the kind of dual usage and the nature of that also by the way if you were running micro Python on the STM32 and controlling it that way it wouldn't be an issue or if you were, you were, you were using C, uh, just like we did on the um, Black Ice MyStorm software. I can hear meowing again. So you change your mind. You want to go through a thoroughfare, do you? Yeah, I thought as much. It's very cold out there, too, because you won't make it. It is chilly out there today. Where are the read and write control lines? Um, 
I haven't filled those in. Thank you. This diagram is really rather complicated. So let me just do that now. So it's quite easy. So I just kind of do this. kind of goes like this as well. It goes to the STM32 as well. Uh, control lines, I think there's, there's only, I think there's only two actually. Write enable and output enable, because it's asynchronous. There's actually a few extra pins that I also haven't mentioned here, maybe three or four, um, such as write protect for the PS RAM. And there is also, I think, an interrupt. Uh, uh, there was something else as well, but they're not, not required for the FPGA. But I might take them to the STM32 because it might be useful. Scruffy, it doesn't show very well on the screen. Hold on. The lack of a bite mask DQM on the 16 bit memory will be a complication for porting some stuff. Yeah, but we just don't have the pins. Um, we're out of pins, Laurie. I don't see an easy way around that. Other than getting the STM to set the mode, but kind of set it into an 8 bit mode. And have it control them. But that's slightly convoluted. Thanks Weston, you have a good one as well. Thanks for joining us. Probably see you on Wednesday. I'll be streaming again on Wednesday, if you're around. Uh, or down on Discord, of course. Ooh. 
Oh, you can get the sugar. Happy need with some sugars. Cool, look forward to it. See you then. Weston. Anything else you can think of, Lai? Oh, you're back, Trinkles. You weren't out very long. It's cold out there. Yeah? Mm. Very cold. Not for you, though. You've got a lovely fur coat. You don't mind, do you? Mind you, you didn't stay out there very long. I mean, it is possible to do the masking, but you'd have to include the STM in the conversation to set the masking up first, which would slow things down considerably, I would imagine, depending how you'd be operating the masking. I mean, if you wanted to do all lower bytes in sequence, then it would be easy, because you could tell the STM to select the lower byte rather than a full 16. But if you wanted to alternate between lower byte and upper byte, that's going to be more troublesome because you'd have to tell STM each time you wanted to change mode from you know 16 to lower byte or 16 to upper byte or from upper whatever combination. If you could keep it in the mode um, it'd be easier. How do you tell which chip to select? What do you mean? Well, you have to map them. Depends on the routing at the end of the day, but yeah. To be determined, I mean, whatever. How does the decoder work? It's easy, it's just a 2-bit to 4-way decoder. So for every 2-bit variation, 0, 0 is one chip, 0, 1 is another chip, 1, 0 is another chip, and 1, 1 is another chip. Yeah. So if you've got two lines, you've got four chip selects, depending on what state the chip selects in. I think we probably only need three, not four, but I need to double check. Which chip controls it? Um, well, on the diagram, it's the HC139. It's uh, this one. So it's got two bits coming in here, and it's got four chip selects going out. Um, Well, it's also got a disable as well. I mean, technically, technically these are negated. Well, you could actually say it's like this. 
where this is the um, enable. Because obviously when the STM is trying to use the SPI, it disables the chip selects. you don't want to be writing random stuff into the memory or whatever. I meant which has 2-bit control. Yeah, the 2-bits comes from the FPGA. Yeah, the... Uh, the um, FPGA has control of them, although don't forget, you know, the STM can take control of those by either holding the FPGA in reset or writing a different synthesis into the IS-40. Because obviously, if you wanted to write to the flash or the PS RAM from the STM, you would need to take over those two bits. But those two bits go to the STM as well, so it can do that. So the situation can be reversed, but remember the caveat that you'd the STM32 doesn't have complete access to the address bus, but it can write a synthesis to the IS-40, which it can use a data bus to talk to the IS-40 in order to um, mux the data onto the address bus, just like a muxed PS RAM. It's just useful, potentially, to be able to do faster direct writes into flash not really for ram it's more for programming the flash over usb or you can do it a more convoluted way over the uart to the i40 etc when it's running its retro stuff oh i post has just tipped up Howdy. <laughs> well, I finally got the uh, remarkable working, uh, the remarkable software working on on this Linux by running Wine, so I can now scribble my diagrams once again. That's probably a bad thing, actually. <laughs> For those not particularly fond of my scribbling, but it's good. I'm just explaining. We've made a bit of a change um, from the conversation on Wednesday. We re I've realised that I couldn't easily get away with using the Cortex. M0 STM32. And I've now converted to an STM32 F7, but it's one with lots and lots of balls on it, um, which improves things slightly. But it now means that we've got a 16 bit bus data bus between the IS40 and the STM32 when it's in retro mode. And you can kind of see that from the uh, diagram. Feel free to ask any questions I post. Did that answer your question, by the way, Laurie, about the 2-bit control, the select control? So normally in retro situation, the FPGA has control, but there's nothing stopping us 
uh, writing a different synthesis into the ICE-40 such that the STM32 can take control of that. I mean, the pins are connected to the STM32 anyhow because it wants to know what peripherals being addressed. So it knows when it's being addressed, for example. Um, but also so that it can select devices. Or hold the ice 40 and reset and do it. However, it doesn't control the address bus when it does that. So. Okay, I think Laurie's kind of understands my uh, weird diagram now. Which is a bonus. We're just trying to make sure we've covered all our bases here. My post. Oh, and the other thing that changed, uh, we're not putting the microcontroller on the mezzanine because we don't need to anymore because it's the same microcontroller, the retro, as for the other mezzanines. So it can it can stay on the um, uh, ice logic bench along with the USB connectors and the depot connector, etc., etc. Oh, the, the other news, uh, I've ordered the flash and PS RAM memory for the retro and also the decoders, as well as the uh, USB de um, interface devices, which help me decode the power delivery. What do you want, Twinkle? Do you want to go out now? Or do you want the tension? It's tensions. Is that what you need? Lots of attentions today. Is it? Rather sharp, of course. You really want to be there, do you? I'm not going to come and play in the middle of a stream. Uh, I post this. So the PS RAM and SD RAM are on the retro mares. Yes, they are. I did think about whether it would be possible to put it on the board, but it's actually yeah, quite difficult. It also limits us in the non-retro scenario. Basically, PS RAM SD, sorry, PS RAM and flash and decoder chip are on the MES. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, the SD RAM, sorry. Is connected to the STM32. That's a new addition. Sorry, I post. You won't realise that. Are you going out again? You're just in one of those funny moods, aren't you, Twinkle? Cool. So yeah, the STM32. This new one has 176 BGA balls. So. And because it's got an FMC controller that supports SD RAM, I can actually add an SD RAM chip to it, which I think I can get hold of. So it has its own, you know, bunch of SD RAM memory. So it does change the game a little bit. Sorry, you're probably just catching that I post because we did go through all of this, but keep firing away and I can answer the questions so that you understand what the differences are. It's a bit of a jump. Um, on this diagram, so do you know what's what? The SD RAM connected to the uh, STM32 is this one. And I think I might be able to get up to eight megabytes of SD RAM. Um, the flash and the PS RAM, which are connected to the ICE 40 address data bus, the asynchronous bus, are these ones here. Uh, 
And so when you're running your uh, retro cores, it's running for these uh, flash and RAM. Whatever you're running on STM32 runs with its inside RAM and or using the SD RAM as well. Uh, also, the USB on this uh, microcontroller is a high speed USB 2. So it's a 480 megabit per second. So it's a lot faster as well, which gives us all sorts of advantages on the host side, which is another benefit on change since Wednesday. Um, uh, SRAM's been out since Wednesday, uh, I post. We're using PS RAM which is like a 70 nanoseconds RAM. So it looks like SRAM from the outside. You don't have the weight stacks and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> My um, Remarkable has useful features such as magnetic attachment folding the pens and stuff. But I've noticed it's picking up bits of solder legs that I chopped off resistor recently. I think when I was uh, building these, the legs off the uh, seven seg on the back seems to have, seems to have picked them up. That's because I put it on that desk, on the bench. Um, the flash serves the STM as well. The STM has its own uh, quad SPI flash here. Um, but we were talking about a way so that the STM can use a data bus and uh, fill the flash what what it has to do is it um, to do that it has to write a synthesis into the ice 40 which is like a, a PS mux so the first two bytes of data will set the address in the ice 40 that then presents you know the correct address on the address bus and then it can send the data it, it, by controlling the chip selects here and then send the data over the data bus to the flash and it can tell the ice 40 to uh, increment the address as it's doing it um, for example which may prove like uh, an easier way to you know update the flash as in the retro flash um, from USB. Otherwise, what it has to do is it takes the data over USB, which it then sends down to the UART to the IS40 running the retro core, which then writes it to the flash itself. So there's two ways of doing it. Um, yeah, I know the PS RAM, but I didn't realize it was replacing the S RAM. But that is all good. Uh, anyway, folk knowledge. So, when retro core starts up, it needs to bootstrap its system ROMs into the flash memory. Well, it depends. Um, not necessarily, Laurie, because the STM32 may have already written into the flash memory. Depends on what you're thinking of. It would be nice if it referred to them by name. So tell the STM32 that it wants a file from the SD card or a file system from flash memory and starts the streaming process. Um, well, what would happen is 
it would need to address um, I mean what you could do probably the simplest way of doing that operation say the retro ice 40 wants to read what's on the SD card here so the STM has a directory listing it could send that directory listing over the UART the ice 40 running the retro could then decide uh, which is the uh, image or file that I want it could then you know have associated with each of the file names an identity so in other words when the STM sends the file names to the ice 40 it could send like a an indexed hash or something of the files then the retro ice 40 program can just request that um, identity um, and having written that identity on the data bus to the STM32 to the correct port address because remember that this is addressable or partially addressable the STM32 would then go and fetch uh, the file or image and start streaming the data back um, two bytes at a time So the STM32 that wants a file on the SD card or file system flash memory and starts the streaming process. But the STM32 can't write into the ICE40's flash memory as it needs the help of the ICE40. That all sounds too complex. Right, but there's two different scenarios. The scenario with the SD card doesn't do that. The scenario with the SD card is that the STM32, when it sees an SD card inserted, uh, will send a list of files and IDs over the UART to the ICE40. So the ICE40 knows what's available to it. It can then do a write to the STM32 SD port with the ID it wishes to retrieve. The STM32 will then stream that back. And the way it will stream it back is because the ICE40 is the master here, the retro is the master, it would first do a write saying which file it wanted by sending the ID back. Then it would do however many reads it needs to to get until it gets like the end of the file an end of file signature or the other information that could be transferred as well as the file ID is the file size of course and it expects to read that many bytes depends which, which, which what you're talking about doing right I'm talking about the initial firmware that you might be running on the IS40 then maybe the STM could write that directly to flash but in the case of when you're dealing with reading, say, uh, the SD card, or you're reading from the internal QSPY flash, then it will work in the way that I just explained. The use case I am considering is the system ROMs, not selection of game from floppy right so in th those system roms can be written to the flash in the first place to this flash ahead of the synthesis of the retro Well, say, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Say I want to write the CPC, right? I want to put the ICE40 in CPC mode. So what I'd do first is I'd write the, um, the muxed synthesis to the ICE40. That enables me to then write to the flash where I can put the CPC image, okay? Then, 
when the retro I then write the retro image the CPC no I then said the signal for the eyes 40 to then read that from flash and boot itself Uh, Laurie saying, uh, so uh, are we saying that we have a separate eyes 40 bitstream whose only purpose is to write to the eyes 40 flash? Um, yes, we could have, or you could combine it with the retro ones, depends on space and things like that. But yeah, the only other possibility there is another way of doing it is you could keep keep all of the images the ROMs in QSBI flash so what the ice 40 retro bootloader would do is it would um, it would first be programmed with the correct FPGA image from QSPI flash and then the um, the retro flash would then run on the ICE 40 it would then read from the STM um, the Q the QSPI flash port to read um, its ROM data or it could read it and write it to its own flash in chunks I don't know it's up to you how you operate it really um, what's the uh, best way of doing it because there's multiple ways of doing it I mean there's going to be a lot of flash so you could pre-write all of the ROMs quite easily to the um, to the asynchronous retro flash I think we've got like I can't remember um, damn it I don't have the um, data sheet handy but you can have a lot of different um, ROMs actually in the um, Retro flash. Um, so what Laurie's saying is. What I was saying before is that a better solution is for the system ROMs to be in named files. Can you put a file system in the QSPI flash or internal flash like MicroPython does? Yeah, of course you can. You can partition the uh, flash exactly how you want to. The QSPI flash. But one of the things that you might be missing here, Laurie, is the ROMs could actually be written directly into this flash rather than that flash. 
And all this would need to do is know what the offset was, the starting offset in the, the kind of bootloader. This flash here is really big. In fact, that probably has more capacity than this flash. But yeah, I mean, you've got a choice. There's a number of ways of, of um, you know, slicing this, depending on your preferences or what makes it easy, I guess. I think on the flash side, um, I think there may be up to like 16 megabytes of flash. If I remember rightly. The problem with starting offsets is it's not very controllable. Well, don't you need just like some kind of virtual I mean, you don't need like a PMMMU, but just a very simple wafer fin layer inside the FPGA address bus to deal with that. But I mean, yeah, whatever. Sorry, MMU, not PMMU. basically a table. But I mean, you can work whichever way you prefer working. But there is a way of doing it where it doesn't have to talk to the STM to retrieve the ROM. That could be in its own asynchronous retro flash. Where you can do it by names if you like. I mean, it's not difficult. You, you put more overhead on the STM, but yeah, whatever. Whichever way suits you, Laurie. So the first thing it would have to do is it would have to do a copy. That's the only disadvantage. It has to copy from the STM flash to the um, retro flash, which is an overhead. Whereas if it was already in, you know, the retro flash, it could boot straight into it. See, Laurie is typing, so. Uh, I want to get to a position that we have with Mr. of ULX3 with many retro bit streams, many system ROMs, and many game ROMs. 
on an SD card. Well, yeah, there's no problem doing that. I guess what I was suggesting was something that kind of improves on that as well to give you faster ROM boot times. But yeah, whatever flavour you like. There's enough flexibility in here that you can cut it any number of different ways. But I think the irony is that the uh, retro flash may actually be bigger than the STM flash. Although it won't be bigger than the uh, SD card, of course. depending on what size SD card you put in there, but yeah, SD cards are ginormous. Um, I posted to say, if I understand it correctly, the 16-bit flash would be much faster than the SD card, yes. Um, I think it would be, yeah, potentially. But I mean, the flash is, what, 19 nanosecond flash. So it's not particularly rapid. Um, when you're reading it over an SD card, that's going to be slower, probably. Um, by the time it's gone through the STM32, etc., and then transferred over the data bus. I mean, the offset in flash could be obtained from the STM. If the STM was in charge of writing to the flash, the retro flash, previously, uh, the, ice, the retro could just query the STM at a certain point and say, you know, what's the offset for this particular ROM? If you want it faster still, I guess you can run it from RAM anyhow, but um, yeah. It all depends what speed the retro is running, you know. Whether it's masking or, you know. Well, the reason I was suggesting the STM to hold the index of the offsets was purely because if it was in charge of writing them in the first place, that would make sense. You wouldn't want two different ones. You could think of it as a boot vector or something that you get from the STM. It's just a different way of operating. It may be more efficient. I don't know. I know you, if you're used to just working with the SD uh, card, then, you know, it's quite simple. But don't forget, we've got all of that flash now on the retro. So 
we can choose to do things differently and you don't have to put it all there necessarily maybe you just want to put a selection there that you're going to switch between for example i guess if you're dealing with the well with roms you would need to do it but i'm just thinking the beeb has its own kind of sd card access in that case it could be advantageous as well i suppose but If the STM32 is in charge of writing to the ICE40 flash, we would definitely need a dedicated bitstream to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's best to keep it separate, but you could add, you know, the facility into any of the retro ones. Um, but yeah, if you were going to write all of the ROMs or a certain large number of them, from the SD card into the flash as a precursor to loading, you know, the retro image, then, you know, kind of right ahead you know if you're really clever you could have a just in time flasher so the first time you run that retro image it's not in the retro flash but on subsequent occasions the STM could have loaded it so the first time it loads it from SD card and on subsequent times uh, it could just pass the offset back or some such so it could load it directly. Yeah, I mean if it's got very small uh, ROMs, then you could just include it in the FPGA image for the BRAMs. If you didn't need to use the BRAMs for anything else, obviously. But I think a just in time thing would be quite good. So as the users using different retro images, they end up in flash, uh, retro flash. So that they can switch between them quickly then. I like the just-in-time idea, although it does complicate it slightly. The point is, there's loads of options. You know, you can skin this in a multitude of different um, different ways, really. How are we doing for time? Right, it's twenty, twenty half past ten. So are you happy with that, Laurie? Does that kind of answer your questions and enable you to see the different ways of um, that we can do this? And there are several, from the traditional read it indirectly from the SD card all the way through to have them preloaded in flash or something in between like a just-in-time system. The first time it loads it from the SD card and then it keeps it in flash. Till such point that the flash is full, then it starts replacing things. But then you're into, um, you have to be careful about fragmentation and stuff. I just hope, yes, I like the architecture. I just hope we, mainly you, in brackets, can make it all work. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. I mean, you know, some of it will take longer than others. You know, we might need to start basic. The hardware will be there. That will be fixed. That won't change. 
and then we write more and more software for the STM32 to handle, you know, the more edge cases and we put more and more of this stuff, you know, the HDL for the ICE 40. What I love about this diagram is um, how small the tile bit is. <laughs> Down here. How small and irrelevant the tile bit looks <laughs> compared to everything else. And we haven't even talked about the other use cases. We're still really just talking about, you know, the retro situation. Uh, what applies to the retro situation here also applies to any of the soft core stuff. I will of course help with the HDL retro ports and help a bit with the firmware. Thanks Laurie, I appreciate it mate. No pressure then. <laughs> I've got to get the hardware done first, otherwise we won't be able to do anything. So uh, yeah. Um, you know, and on top of all of that, uh, one of the things that you would have missed I post is, because we've got that SD RAM on the STM32 now, potentially um, we could probably also run micro Python which adds an interesting angle and even maybe later circuit Python and by the way if we do the circuit Python thing uh, then the USB would be mountable as well as a serial port <clears throat> which provides all sorts of other interesting ideas and goodies. And yet the soft core side of it, you know, I know we haven't touched on, but it's very much like the retro, you know, with in this configuration, uh, primarily, you know, the ICE 40 is in control. You know, when you put that synthesized image on it, apart from the slave image that I talked about for writing to flash. In the other cases here, you know, if you're running a soft core on the ice 40, it's exactly the same as a retro. You know, that that risk five core or whatever has access to the, you know, the asynchronous flash, the asynchronous PS RAM in the same way, and access to the STM32, to its ADCs, to its SD you know, not, um, buffering, uh, and also sending data to and fro up and down via USB. Something else that the STM32 could do if you had an SD card in there um, it could receive the data from the ICE 40, you know, in the logic analyzer uh, manner, and it could actually write that to the SD card. And because it has the fast USB, um, that could be virtualized and mounted over USB to pick the data up. Uh, particularly if you're using something like circuit Python slash micro Python. Uh, what is the spec of the upgraded STM32? So it's a it's the same um, family as the STM32 we were going to use originally on here. So it's an STM32 F7 um, family chip. I think it has about 256k of RAM, something like that doesn't have much internal flash probably only about 64k but it's got we've got quite SPI flash on there as well so
It's a 260 megahertz core, 32 bit ARM, obviously. Basically, turn the FPGA into a GPU for the STM. Kind of. We did have. We were having another conversation. Oh yeah, I should probably. Um, one other idea that I had um, is, you know, we were going to have like a VGA tile, and then I was thinking of doing a HDMI tile. Well, we could do a kind of a, a GPU tile. Back. which basically consists of the HDMI port the audio codec and then what we do is we put a an up 5k FPGA on that um, which has like a Surdes or serial link to the ICE 40 and a few control lines and then we add the hyper RAM to the up 5k and then that up 5k basically becomes a GPU with fast serial access channels, like four access channels between the uh, main FPGA and that FPGA. So it'd be like a pro graphic solution. Probably not much help with the uh, retro stuff because they need to write directly. Um, but in the soft core scenario, it'd be interesting or demo scene type scenarios um, and it would also so it has the internal RAM which is about one megabit 128k and then you'd have hyper RAM as well because obviously the 128 doesn't give you enough for a decent sized display but with the hyper RAM um, you'd have enough to display you know a number of different resolutions um, and it's probably fast enough that you can write to it and read to it if you're caching using the internal SRAM such that you could use it as a frame buffer no it's not a dual port hyper RAM it's just a regular one Such a GPU tile could help with retro ports, could it? Are you sure? Not quite sure how it works with the retro ports. Don't they like to directly write to the um, to the memory randomly as a frame buffer? N64 would use it. Yeah, I don't know enough about the N64 construction. Does it abstract the um, graphics away then? Either way, we, we, we could basically offer an advanced um, a kind of GPU based graphics. And of course, by using the UP 5K, it's all done in HDL using the same tools that we have. Not only that, the FPGA could then program it. Um, there'd be enough pins to do that. So you'd have like four SPI pins on a tile, and then the other eight SPI pins are four thirty pairs for fast exchange of uh, graphical information commands and or data for the frame buffer yeah one issue with the retro ports is the original code used to drive CRTs is not compatible with current monitors yeah tracing the beam and all that uh, the mister takes the signals and converts them to HDMI the GPU tile could do that yeah yeah certainly or some abstraction like that with a kind of surdays in between the two shuffling the information or more shoving actually because it tends to be in one direction writing serializing at high speed
but again it'd be interesting i thought you'd like that as well i post i know that you want to do some gpu work and from a teaching and learning point point of view it'd be really good you know having learnt how to do soft cores and retro cores and all of this you can now learn how to do gpus right super cool if you're really clever you could have multiple hdmis multiple screen support two tiles with gpus one on each how about that that's impressive what a deck that would be a really good little kind of risk five gaming deck with multiple uh, monitor support Well, or you could just use one port for uh, the controls, the equivalent of the on-screen displays <laughs> of some such. Who knows? There are lots of possibilities. I'm just going to get some more water back in a sec, folks. You cut your mind. Which side of the door you want to be on, cat? Oh, oh it's purry cat. No, don't stand on my keyboard. I know how much you cats love to do that. We know how much you love to do that. You're just going to put fluff all over my desk now, aren't you? Softball, troublemaker. I can barely see you because you're black, you see. Fade into my shirt. You're sitting down now. Come on, get cosy. Don't press my keys. You're going round and round. You need to sit down. Who'd have them? Who'd have them? Right, settle down then, good. Right, any other questions, folks? We've got a little bit more time. Look, your fluff's all over my desk again. Twinkle. Typical for clearing up your stuff. You need to get the hoover out. Mm. I know, 
you just want to be on the internet just like all the other cats or he says I have a problem with my current Amstrad CPC port that it does not play some games because I generate the VGA signal directly from VRAM rather than exactly emulating the original CRTC and gate array chips. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how, um, how the internals of that are set up. If I had a tile that could take something like the composite or 15 megahertz RGB signal that the original machine generated that would be very helpful so you're saying there's um, I mean you know if you if you went the tile route that we're talking about here um, that would be possible I mean instead of using eight survey type data channels you could have the raw RGB are these digital signals I don't know if they're digital signals you could use them How many signals would you need? Is it how many bits for each colour? Well, you say it's composite. I don't know. I, I need to understand more about how the signal was formed. Is it a digital signal or is it an analog signal? If it was an analog signal, it would probably. Um, you couldn't do it. Yes, yeah, so it would be digital. And how many pins are you talking about? One for each colour or... And does it have like sync signals and stuff? But I mean there's no reason why you couldn't... Assuming there's enough pins, there's no reason why uh, it couldn't work that way. And do the conversion for you. I guess. Fluff everywhere. Thank you very much, Twinkle. <coughs> and all over my shirt. Typical. Cats, eh? So you're all up to speed. Are you up to speed, I post, you think? I mean, you can always review the earlier part when I um, put the recording up, I guess. That probably won't be up there until later. It takes a while to upload it and then it has to transcode it and process it and filter it and de-copyright it and all that crap. And I post gets it. That's cool. Good. Very good considering you stumbled in halfway through. The future is the GPU tile available. I would definitely buy that. Yeah, I thought it was quite a good idea. Um, there is some cost to it because you have to add a, you know, $6 FPGA 
you have to add uh, several dollars of hyper flash sorry hyper ram um, then a HDMI connector and an audio codec that, that's all that's required really so it wouldn't be like hugely expensive but it would be significantly more expensive than uh, um, than just a HDMI connector and um, the current conversion chip slash protection and all that yeah well it's an in interesting idea to explore I think I mean, even if it doesn't make that much financial sense, really, it's good from a learning exercise and as an educational tool. So, you know, so what if it costs a bit more? It's probably worth it for what you get out of it educationally. Um, I think. And I'd be really interested to see what Laurie can do in terms of using it to improve retro. Retro graphics output conversions. What is it to call? You are like a little lost sheep today, aren't you? Is it because it's so cold out? Uh, the setup you have now could do that for the most part, at least from my perspective. I would use the STM as a CPU and FPGA as a GPU. Um, well, that's another option. Um, however, you probably need faster memory for anything other than a retro type application. In which case you'd go for a, a hyper flash mezzanine rather than the retro flash. Oh, yeah, the ice 40 is capable of it but you just need um, when you do the frame buffer uh, you've got to be able to read and write from it um, which means um, it needs to be fairly responsive the PS RAM for the retro is, is fast enough for retro applications you know because they're running down at you know 15 megahertz or below but when you're talking about um, something else then you might need some memory that's a bit more nippy um, yeah there's all sorts of tricks you can perform interleaving etc or the old interlace remember when you first had uh, you know 1024 by 768 resolution IBM introduced it on their uh, graphics cards I remember working on some of that stuff and um, that was interlaced to start with um, and basically yeah you do every other line but um, it's kind of flickery when you have a hard line I mean, there, there's options. There are lots of options. You know, one, one of the advantage of 
aren't uh, big advantages of the uh, you know the ice uh, logic bench is that it has this modular architecture so you can slot in all sorts of bits and bobs on top of what's already there we're trying to build a good base on top of what you can you can build or add in so there's uh, a lot that can be um, you know added to achieve different aims and kind of modular hardware and HDL way Ooh. Mm -hmm. Oh, we will get round to doing an ECP five one at some point. But let's get all this stuff done first before we work on that stuff. Oh uh, yeah, getting hold of ECB fives is tough. then getting hold of lots of stuff right now is tough quite frankly I was looking for some weird oh, resistors I was having trouble getting hold of resistor arrays yesterday for Christ's sakes uh, what's this uh, Laurie this is the code for the ZX8081 to convert the original output to VGA if I look at that, am I actually going to understand it though? It's coming in cold. HS out, VS out, DE out, and V out. It has a C sync and a video in signal. C sync is a combination of V sync and H sync, yeah. That have to be separated. In the analog sense or digital sense. Because so I've seen composite syncs where, you know, you have a negative going pulse for say H sync and a you know, positive going on for the V-Sync and stuff, but um, and, and then it hovers in between the, the voltages, but that's kind of an analog way of doing things where you mix the H and V-Syncs. Yeah, or you can mix both. That's the old sync on green trick as well, Laurie. Where VGA used to support um, sync on green. So you just had three signals. You had red, green and blue. But the green signal also included the composite sync. But that's very much analogue because it works at slightly different voltages in order to encode the signal. 
I remember rightly. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'd have to look at, I've not looked at the digital versions to know what that means. But if they're digital, then yeah, sure, you could, um, wouldn't be difficult to interpret the signals. But I'd need to look at it a bit more deeply and understand what's going on, because I don't think I've ever looked at those. I might have done actually a long, long time ago, like, you know, stupid years ago, decades. I can't remember if the uh, schematics were available or not, or when they were available. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that uh, the GPU could do is you could have a um, uh, an IO signal directly from the STM32 to the GPU to do an overlay. So if you look at the tile, not only have you got the GPIOs from the FPGA itself, but you've also got some GPIOs in there. You've got like potentially three GPIOs and an interrupt connected to the STM32 that could be used to um, send OSD information, for example. don't involve the uh, ice 40 at all i'm not sure if that makes sense but you could do that if you wanted to history of the retro on black ice is that Hoglet got the uh, Acorn Atom, BBC Micro, Jupiter Ace and Z80 working on black ice one. Yeah, it's, it's, if you look back through the anals of the MyStorm forum, you'll probably just look at uh, Hoglet posts and you'll see a whole bunch of them. Uh, the forum never went down, I post. <laughs> it's just um, somewhat uh, in terms of the configuration. I've been trying to fix it, but it's, it is nightmarish. So you have to go through the uh, advanced, you know, because it doesn't recognize the cert. Wow. Wow. Back in are you, Twink? Do you want to go through the door again?
Yes, Laurie's been really busy over the years. Also wrote a really good ebook for the Black Ice, which lots of people used. As well as the retro stuff. Right, I think I'm going to kill the stream now, but I will continue on Discord with you guys. Um, I'm assuming there's nothing more that you need to see on the stream that we can do. You know, we should be able to cover on the um, just through text. Right, so ciao guys, I will see you down on Discord. Uh, I'll probably stream again next week as well on Wednesday. But yeah, see you on Discord in a minute. Ciao.